Members of the jury, the evidence has shown that on July 18, 2014, this community suffered a blow when revered law professor, colleague, son, father, brother, and friend was gunned down in broad daylight in his own home. What enemy or enemies had Mr. Markell made that set into motion such a brutal act? The answer, his own family. What offense had Mr. Markell committed against these people? Wanting to be a good father, refusing to let his children be taken away from him? You've heard a lot about bits and pieces versus the full picture. This is the full picture, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. And this is what all the little bits and pieces over the last couple weeks have added up to. What was the motive for this murder? Wendy Adelson characterized her divorce as unpleasant, but the evidence shows that that is a severe understatement. When they separated in 2012, Wendy Adelson left with the children while Dr. Markell was away on a business trip. This is from State 75. Quote, the wife was gone, the boys were gone, the house was half plundered, the Schwab accounts had been raided, and divorce papers had been left on the bed. Most importantly, there was no indication of where the wife and children were. Worse, for the first 15 days of the separation, wife refused to give husband any address or phone number for where she lived with the children. On September 25, 2012, wife finally answered husband's and his counsel's plea for a proper address, but she gave him a false address that wasn't corrected until four weeks later. When Markell came home from a business trip and found divorce papers on the bed, they demanded the majority of time sharing with the kids, temporary and permanent child support, temporary, bridge the gap, lump sum, and durational alimony, and the wife's attorney's fees and costs. In Markell's response, he said that he is, quote, grieved that the wife has filed for dissolution of the party's marriage, and it is his hope, belief, and desire that the marriage can be saved. Well, we know it couldn't. In January of 2013, Wendy Adelson filed a motion to allow her and her children to relocate to South Florida. They were ages two and three years old at that time. As one basis for this request, Wendy Adelson cites that the wife's parents reside in Coral Springs and the wife's brother resides 20 minutes away. The children are very close to the wife's parents. Then she proposes a 60-40 timesharing schedule in which Mr. Markell will be required to travel from Tallahassee to South Florida every time he wants to see his children. Quote, the wife proposes that during the school year, the husband come to South Florida every other Saturday through Tuesday, and in the off week, come for at least two days to see the children. As another basis for the motion for relocation, Wendy alleges that, quote, the husband has also created a hostile work environment for the wife at FSU School of Law by telling the administration and their joint colleagues that the wife has stolen from him that she has mental health issues, isolating the wife in Tallahassee's small legal community and further limiting the wife's career prospects in the area. Now remember what Wendy Adelson told you when she was on that stand, she was just fine to stay in Tallahassee. She liked it here in Tallahassee. In Markell's answer, he indicates that he's seeking continued <coughs> equal time sharing in Tallahassee he seeks sole parental responsibility on issues related to education, religion, and the medical upbringing of these children. And as y'all learned through the course of this evidence, you learned how important it was for Mr. Markell to be involved in the kids' education and their religious upbringing. Markell's dedication in these areas is highlighted by the fact that the very last thing he did after he dropped his kids off and uh, worked out was make a phone call to Stuart Schlazer, somebody that he was reaching out to to try to get information about the kids' schooling and schooling prospects for the kids. 
In addition, you'll recall when the Adelson's testimony that Mr. Markell was devout in his beliefs and was adamant that his boys should be raised in an environment that observed Jewish traditions and was committed to the Jewish faith. Quote, Once examined in context, the sole reason the wife wishes to relocate with the par party's minor children is so she can be closer to her parents. The wife has done nothing to facilitate the children's connection to the Jewish community since the separation. She not only introduced them to a non-kosher diet since the separation, she not only introduced them to, uh, oh, but she on her weekends refused to allow the husband to continue the pre-separation practice they had had of the children uh, attending synagogue. In conjunction with the filings from the divorce, you have these emails that were introduced as States 80. This email is from Donna Adelson to Wendy Adelson. It's dated May 3rd, 2013. However, Gibbers has made his divorce a full-time job to attempt to get what he's always gotten, his way. The most important part of your divorce is, all caps, relocation. I sincerely hope your attorney understands that this is non-negotiable. Those trips need to be coordinated with a very angry man. Danny thinks he's very important, and as always, he always thinks his needs come first. However, a hot temper and verbal abuse is what you need to emphasize, that you suffered under his reign Narcissistic personality disorder causes major problems in a marriage, especially when one believes that because he attended Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law, he's clearly better and smarter than anyone else, including you, which technically is correct. It's super important for the judge to get the message that this guy's a big bully. I know she'll be able to read that when you submit copies of some, that when you submit some copies of the emails he sent you. He feels if he said something, that's it. Well, that's not it. You were in fear of his temper, and so you did not want to reveal your address. That's why she kept the kids away for how many ever weeks. Mr. Markell has become a religious zealot over the last few years since the birth of our first son, taking him to synagogue with him as an infant so that he can absorb the music and prayers What's going to happen in June when he wants to go to three different conferences? Don't let him go. If you do, you're enabling and facilitating your stay in Tallahassee. Another bribe to get him to allow relocation should be the offer of plane tickets. This is the grandmother coaching Wendy, Wendy Adelson, on how to try to facilitate this relocation. On May 6, 2013, Dan Markell filed a motion to compel Wendy Adelson to honor an agreement they had regarding access to the children. In this document, Markell alleges <coughs> the wife is engaged in a pattern of interfering with the husband's access to the children. Fast forward to June of 2013, there's an order denying Wendy's motion for relocation with prejudice. That means it cannot be raised again. She cannot move to South Florida with those children by court order. This is the summer of 2013, the same time frame that Wendy Adelson later tells Jeffrey Lacoste that her brother, Charlie Adelson, was looking into all options to resolve the relocation problem, including having Dan Markell killed. On May and July of 2013, ahead of myself here, but in May and July of 2013, there were two mediations conducted in this divorce, both of which resulted in an impasse. Um, there's a quote from one of the filings that the wife is merely, quote, stuck in Tallahassee until the husband decides the time is right for him to leave. The wife and her affluent parents who are bankrolling the wife's litigation so that they can enjoy closer access to the grandchildren. Again, an email, these are in 
chronological order. So this next email is dated Thursday, June 25th, 2013. This one is from that Donna Harvey at gmail.com address that both Harvey Adelson and Donna Adelson used. And it's signed Love Mom and Dad, and it's to Wendy Adelson. Never, never, never give up. It's time for action. It's time to take control of your life and not let Gibbers think he just won anything by having you remain in Tallahassee. Let's show this F blank 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 what will make him absolutely miserable. You know his weak points. Money, religion, control. You have five weeks before your court date. I know you have a job that keeps you very busy. However, the rest of your life and consequently dad's, mine, and yes, even Charlie's will be affected by how well you can perform slash act between uh, now and July 31st. You can be a good actress when you want to. I've seen you in action. You just need to put on the performance of your life. Jibbers hasn't beaten the Adelson family yet. You have a very strong family behind you. Just remember that. Dad and I have done everything we could to try to help you for the last 10 months. Now it's time to help yourself. We believe that you will be able to make this happen. If you can put these actions before everything else this month, yada yada, here's the plan of action. Down is up. All right, plan of action. Number one, take a photo of the boys dressed nicely, standing at the front door or by the sign of a church in Tallahassee. Then change your Facebook status photo to this one so everyone will see this. Perhaps a line under the photo with, quote, new beginnings in Tallahassee might be nice. Within minutes, Jibber should either see this or will be getting calls from his friends, acquaintances about this. Hmm? How happy do you think he'll be? Make arrangements to get the boys caught up with a private tutor, teenage Catholic church member, who will come to the house and teach the young men about Jesus. Number three, let Jibbers know that your children will be baptized in the Catholic church, and you'll certainly invite them to the event. Let him know that the Catholic church is a big part of your life now with the boys and you'd like him to be a part of it. As long as he wants you to remain in Tallahassee, the boys will be involved with you in church-related activities and ceremonies. Number four, summer camp. Don't worry about that one. Number five, register for them, them for toddler classes at the church. I've looked into this. Mom has looked into this. And even if they don't go, we can show Jibbers that they are enrolled for the fall semester. And you cannot tell anyone this is an act. Somehow it will get back to him. Take control from him. Get to him psychologically. He's going to want you to stop this. Wendy, you've been through a difficult year. Yada yada, now you have one final opportunity to make him angry. We want him ticked off so he realizes that he could lose control over the kids. We plan to make a financial offer to him to allow this relocation. You need to work this plan and we'll help you through it so that it may affect how much we will offer him. Maybe he'd be willing to let you relocate if he knew his children would attend a private Hebrew academy like Donna Klein in Boca. Or perhaps he'd like to invite like them to invite him to a Christmas party at their other Sunday school. I know you would never want to think that you didn't do absolutely everything you could to try to come down to your family. It's time for you to show us that you can put the performance, put on the performance of your life in the next few weeks. I mean, this is not a normal amount of pressure for this thing to get done, right? Got one more in here. Charlie brought up a good point. I'm not going to read it. You see it. <coughs> Dress your kids up in Hitler youth uniforms. Take 
something from him. You need to take something from him in order to get him to negotiate it back. Take something that he wants. Pretend, pretend, pretend. All right, now the payoff. This payoff can put him at the point, blah, 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 $4 million range. Point of this, they're willing to offer a million dollars. We're planning on you, Charlie, and Dad and I going as high as equal parts. There it is. In a $1 million offer to bribe Mr. Markell to give up his kids. On July 31st, 2013, the divorce between Dan Markell and Wendy Markell was made final. They reached an agreement just hours before the matter was scheduled to go to a trial. But litigation continued and even increased as both parties continued to file motions alleging the other was in violation of the settlement agreement, uh, in violation of the divorce. On October 31st, 2013, Wendy Adelson filed a motion to enforce the marital settlement agreement. Five months before his murder on February 14, 2014. <clears throat> oh. All right. February 14, 2014, so five months before the murder, Mr. Markell files this particularly biting counter motion in which he reiterates his feelings about the way she left the relationship, talking about her abandoning the marital home, taking everything out of the home, leaving behind no address. He mentions that she took his stuff, including his tennis racket. He talks about family heirlooms and jewelry that was taken hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash and equities. And then, he talks about the frivolous petition that she filed and how false it was. He talks about how she's an attorney authorized to practice law before the Florida, or by the Florida Bar also a clinical professor of law at Florida State University. <clears throat> Despite her professional and legal obligations to act in a manner that reflects honesty, trustworthiness, and fitness to be a lawyer, and despite the oath that averts the correctness of the financial affidavit on pains of liability for perjury and criminal prosecution, former wife filed a false and misleading financial disclosure form. He's accusing her of a crime. He's threatening to go after her bar card. He's accusing her of being unethical and of lying to the court. Specifically, he's alleging that her TIAA CREF account was not disclosed and that the failure to disclose it renders the settlement agreement null and void. <coughs> Talks about how she's helped herself to all of this property she has wealthy parents who placed her in a financial cocoon, and upon belief by paying her legal fees, they allowed and encouraged her to take the most aggressive and unsubstantiated legal postures possible, because there would be no financial consequence for her doing so. Then, spite and words, it's clear that this was an extremely contentious divorce with high emotions and a lot at stake for both sides. Listen to part of this email from the Donna Harvey uh, email address to Wendy Adelson dated February 18th, 2014. I think it's really important to get the parenting coordinator to either testify or be brought to deposition, perhaps by your attorney, so we can get her to request that Elvis, I don't know why we're calling him Elvis, be court ordered for psychological testing. And just look at the, the title of the response. And they're seeking sanctions against each other. OK. 
counter motion for enforcement of MSA on parenting issues and motion for contempt and sanctions. On March 26th, 2014, March 26th, 2014, Mr. Markell files this motion alleging that the grandmother of these children, Donna Adelson, has disparaged him to the children. Quote, Grandma says you're stupid. She says you're trying to take her sunshines away from her. And Grandma says she hates you. Dan Markell is requesting the court to enjoin the former wife from allowing the maternal grandmother to have unsupervised time with the children and to impose appropriate limitations to safeguard the children from being subjected to disparaging comments about their father. He is moving to preclude her from having contact with these kids unless she's supervised. How do you think that went over based on what we know about Donna Adelson? And as we know, this issue never made it to hearing because there were several lawyer changes and other delays, and ultimately, Dan Markell was murdered. And guess what? Relocation was no longer a problem. Within 48 hours, Wendy and those kids had moved to South Florida, never to return to Tallahassee. <coughs> the emails in States Exhibit 80 shed some light on how the Adelson family responded and how involved they got in this divorce that their daughter was engaged in. The pleadings and allegations that Mr. Markell filed against Wendy and against her mother were very contentious. Obviously, there is a lot of bad blood. Maybe I'm getting excited and pushing buttons. Um, Back in the summer of 2013, when Wendy Adelson's motion for relocation was initially denied, we know that Charlie had looked into having Dan Markell killed. But as the defense points out, Charlie didn't even know Catherine Magdanella at that time, and hence the murder did not happen at that time. When did Wendy Adelson mention to Jeffrey Lacoste that his brother had looked into getting this done a year ago? on July 13, 2014. That's when she told the cops about this, just five days before Dan Markell was killed. But the seed for this conspiracy had already been planted when Charlie had looked into committing the murder back during the summer of 2013. That was the time when the judge ruled against Wendy and the kid moving, kids moving to South Florida. And after the relocation failed, fast forward, to the next really significant event, which is it being on the line whether or not Don Adelson is going to be permitted to have continued contact with these kids that's unsupervised. Based on the emails we recovered, how do you think Donna took the news that Gibbers was trying to police her contact with her own grandchildren? According to Donna Adelson, quote, something has to be done about this asshole. He hasn't beaten the Adelsons yet, but he was beating them wasn't he? After paying for several lawyers and engaging in all these bitter legal battles, Wendy and the boys still were in Tallahassee. And as Wendy told Jeffrey Lacoste, she was never going to be able to move to South Florida unless something happened to Danny. And she was right. What happened after his murder? She moved to South Florida and she systematically erased their father from these boys' lives. She changed their names from Markel to Adelson. Why? Because there was too much media attention with the name Markel in it? Wasn't there a lot of media attention with the name Adelson in it? And if that was really her reason, why drop the middle name that was in honor of the paternal uh, ancestors? Why keep Dan Markel's parents away from the children? for any other purpose other than to obliterate the memory of their father. So it's the state's theory. Let's see where we are here. Here's Wendy's trip from her residence down to the crime scene and then to the liquor store where she purchases bullet whiskey. And then goes all the way back up to Mosaic, 
where she engages in a lunch date. When she pulls up to the crime scene, oh, there's where she could have gone to get liquor. When she pulls up to the crime scene, she doesn't get out. She doesn't ask any questions. She doesn't make any phone calls. She doesn't call 911. She, this is the, the man that has her children. She doesn't call the daycare to find out, are my kids okay? Nothing. And then she told you guys that she just observed the crime scene tape on her way by Centerville Road, which is not possible. Could not see the crime scene tape from Centerville Road. And as you know from the testimony of Officer Brannon and her prior inconsist inconsistent statement in her interview, she did go down to that crime scene. It's the state's theory that there are other people, people other than those who have been charged, people other than the two folks that are on trial here today that you all are concerned about. And these people also bear responsibility for the murder of Professor Markell. Although you are not being asked to decide the guilt of anybody on that top row, and Mr. Rivera's already pled, it's relevant for you to understand the roles that all of these people played, the motive for this crime, in order to make a determination about the guilt of the two folks that are on trial here and for you to decide here today. Do these two defendants fit into this conspiracy? If so, how? If this is done out of necessity, it's not a desperation thing. I want you all to see the whole picture. That being said, it's natural for you to to wonder what's going on with these other people, when and how will they be charged. All of those things are natural things to think about and wonder, but not okay to affect your decision in this case, as you, by your oath, must render a verdict based on the evidence in the law in this case as to these two defendants individually. Much has been made regarding my personal feelings about charging the Adelsons. Um, that should not affect your verdict at all. What my personal feelings are, you probably don't know what they are. Maybe you think I'm eager to do this again in the near future. Um, but it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is the evidence and the law that's before you as it pertains to these two defendants. As we talked about in jury selection, you've been sworn as the jury for these defendants and must make a wise and legal decision about their roles in this larger plot. Anyone else is for another day or for another jury. But to understand where the two fit in, you have to understand the motives and events that led up to them being hired to commit the crime. So the evidence that you've heard concerning the Adelsons is necessary. While we're on the topic of the Adelsons, it's worth pointing out that absent their, involve, uh, absent their involvement would be giant coincidences. So was there a plan to frame Jeffrey Lacoste for this? That was one thing. When the Adelson broke up with him the week before the murder, she knew he had plans to leave town, like at the exact time that Dan Markell ended up being killed, and then suggested his name to law enforcement as a bitter ex-boyfriend who might have had an ax to grind. Um, luckily, he left a day early, so he had a great alibi. What about this thing with the TV? Charlie Adelson gets Wendy Adelson a TV as a divorce present, as a cheaper alternative to hiring a hitman. Then the same TV is Wendy Adelson's <coughs> alibi for the time that her husband is murdered. A service appointment that her mother set up for her from South Florida. And then on the wire when Donna is talking about, well, that didn't come in, never mind, strike that. And what about Wendy Adelson going completely out of her way, that slide that I just showed you, to, to visit the crime scene when the crime scene tape is up? That's not a shortcut to where she was going. That liquor store is not on the way to where she was going. Why doesn't she stop to ask what's going on when she sees all these emergency vehicles at her children's father's home? What about uh, the evidence that Catherine uh, Magbanoa already knew that the crime was done when she got that phone call from Sigredo Garcia. Remember the testimony that the first call that either Mr. Rivera or Mr. Garcia made after the murder was done was to Catherine Magbanoa. And what did Garcia say? It's done. And what did Catherine Magbanoa say? I know. How did she know? I cannot answer that question. Possibly, I mean, somebody had to tell her. 
Um, or perhaps she meant it figuratively, like I'm waiting by the phone for this thing to get done, and when I see the phone ring and it's you, I knew it was done. Don't know the answer. Here's Catherine Magbanawa and Wendy Adelson taken on the beach just outside her parents' condo on June 15, 2014. So this is 10 days after the first botched murder trip and about a month before the actual murder. Rivera says that Catherine Magbanoa told them the murder had to be done on July 18th. Why did it have to get done on July 18th? Because Dan Markell was planning to leave town the next day, and this is a fact that has been confirmed by Wendy Adelson. Somebody with access to Mr. Markell's schedule, AKA some Adelson, had to have relayed this information to Ms. McBanoa for her to know. How would Louis Rivera know to say that? That's not in the discovery. How would he know to say that they had to get it done because Mr. Markell was leaving town the next day? Let's talk a little bit about Mr. Rivera. <clears throat> Mr. Rivera is not my best friend from childhood. Mr. Rivera is not the guy that my child's father considers a brother and a best friend. He is not the person that I hired to do the murder. I did not get to pick Louis Rivera. Rivera is here because these two defendants chose to do a crime with him. And he chose, yes, to save his own butt, to do a deal. He chose to come forward with the truth in exchange for a deal. He is a bad dude. You've heard lots of stuff to corroborate that, and I wouldn't try to dispute that. He is a bad dude. That's why they picked him to come assist with this. But his Latin King status has nothing to do with the murder other than it makes him a bad dude and a good candidate as somebody to recruit to do a killing. You have no evidence of any connection between this Latin King specter that's been raised for you and the, the evidence of this particular crime. According to the defense, his deal was the deal of the century to give some testimony that I or someone else spoon-fed to him. What evidence do you have that any information was spoon-fed to him? The defense wants to say he was spoon-fed, but then they also want to say he was terrible and inconsistent and full of it. How can it be both ways? Did I do it? I spoon-fed, but I did a terrible job of it. There is no evidence that anyone told Mr. Vera what to say in this case. His testimony is what it is. If there's inconsistencies in it, if there's inaccurate facts in it, that's what it is. The actual only condition of Mr. Rivera's cooperation agreement in this case is to tell what he knows. Tell the truth. If I'm so desperate to get the Adelsons and I'm spoon feeding Rivera, why wouldn't I just spoon feed him to tell me the Adelsons did it? He was hired by Sigfredo Garcia, his best friend from childhood. And Sigfredo Garcia was hired by Catherine Magbanoa, his child's mother, to do a murder in Tallahassee to assist her other boyfriend, Charles Adelson. And he's just telling you what you already know. You don't have to rely on Louis Rivera. The whole case doesn't hinge on him because he's telling you what you already know from the evidence, all the circumstantial evidence in the case. And he's the direct evidence, the linchpin, that holds it all together and that reveals all the corroboration that you need to make a decision in this case. In jury selection, we talked about the different types of evidence. You know, is it direct? Is it circumstantial? And what about inconsistencies? We talked about that too. And Mr. Rivera has given now, I think, 10 statements in this case over a three-year period about events that happened over five years ago now. So there are going to be inconsistencies, and I'm sure the defense will talk about those. Only you can evaluate these inconsistencies and how much importance to give them. I'm not telling you to ignore them. I want you to look at them, evaluate them, and you make a decision. Lawyers don't get to make a decision as to whether or not these things are important. Did he have an opportunity to see and know the things about which he testified? Not 
a lawyer telling you what's important and what's not. So did he seem to have an opportunity? Yeah, he was there. How could he have known that Rivera shot a hole in the Prius? Unless he was there. I'm sorry, Garcia fired a hole in the passenger floorboard of the Prius. Unless he was there. He saw it. The fact wasn't listed in a media report. The fact wasn't known to law enforcement. Couldn't have known it unless he was there. How could he have known that Dan Markell was scheduled to leave town? A fact that Wendy confirms. Because Magdanawa told he and Garcia that they had to get it done for that reason. Rivera testified that Magdanawa hired Garcia to kill Dan Markell, and that Garcia hired him to assist in the murder, and that Catherine Magdanawa was responsible for getting the money and for paying them once the job was done. That's your principal instruction. You will notice in this ATM video that was taken at 6.46 p.m. on the day of the murder in Pembroke Pines, Florida, consistent with the two of them having traveled south after committing the murder, you will notice that Rivera is in the dark shirt in the driver's seat and that Garcia is in a white shirt on the passenger side. This is consistent with their positions in the vehicle on the bus video, which was taken just moments after the homicide. Rivera says Garcia was the shooter. You don't have to rely on Rivera for that because the evidence corroborates that. You're not going to be the shooter and the getaway driver. The passenger is in a white shirt. The evidence at the crime scene is consistent with a very accurate close range shot by a taller individual. Accurate and close range means not gangster style. It means regular style, consistent with a taller shooter. Was it accurate? Yes, it was, right between the eyes. What evidence corroborates what Rivera says? Mr. Geiger heard a gunshot. He got up and he looked out his window and he saw a Prius, a light colored Prius, pulling out of his neighbor's driveway. That Prius ultimately leads back to Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia. Both of their name, well, Rivera's name and Garcia's number are both on the rental contract for that Prius. Let's review how we got from this image where Mr. Geiger looks out his window to the Prius. All right, so we've got the surveillance video at Premier Gym, which shows the Prius stalking the victim. This bus video, some of it taken shortly before the murder and some of it taken right after the murder, showing the same type of vehicle. Again, you'll notice the white shirt is in the passenger side, dark shirt is the driver. The tower dump from Premier Jim shows a phone number that was linked to Harvey Adelson and that on July 1st, 2014, Sigfredo Garcia made one unanswered call to Harvey Adelson, and that's how, that, that fact is how, that cross-reference is how we managed to pull his number and identify him out of all the data that came out of the tower dump from Premier Jim. Look at the call frequency. Who does Mr. Rivera, who does Mr. Garcia, call frequently, Luis Rivera. And guess who else is also on the tower dump? Luis Rivera. You'll see the phones traveling. We've got evidence to corroborate their phones and when they left, when they arrived. You've got toll plaza information that corroborates or coincides with the phone so that we know exactly when that vehicle was traveling through when that transponder passed through that particular toll booth. 
And we were able to learn from that that this particular Prius. Can you get a good stop point, Ms. Kaplan? We'd like to get the jury. Yes, sir. Right. That this Prius was assigned to Schwartz Hybrid Rental Car Place. So Schwartz Hybrid Rental Car Place basically is the owner of this transponder. They have Priuses that this transponder could potentially be attached to. When we go to Mr. Schwartz, Mr. Schwartz says, yes, that transponder was in fact affixed to a green Prius. That's how we put the Prius, that's how we connect the Prius that Mr. Geiger initially saw fleeing the crime scene and tie it to the rental contract, which has Mr. Rivera's name and his number, and Mr. Uh, Garcia's number listed under brother. Shadrach Noble also, Nobles also puts both men on both trips. He talks about the two having car trouble on the second trip. Well, they have car trouble on both trips, but the second trip is when Mr. Garcia repairs the hose on the Prius. We later learn from Mr. Rivera's proffer how the hole got there. We go back to the Prius and confirm, yes, in fact, a Hole is in the passenger side floorboard. The hole did damage the fuel line, as Mr. Rivera indicated, and the fix that Mr. Garcia put on the vehicle is still there. This would be a good stopping point, Your Honor. All right, I'll take 15 minutes. Just leave your notes and instructions where they are. did notice I was reading a couple of mistakes in the instructions. The only one of substance, I think, is in the aggravation of a felony instruction, the second paragraph. I'll be sending my judicial assistant in with corrected uh, instructions, and she's emailed those to you, so get a chance. We'll take 15 minutes. <laughs> Everybody be seated, please. You may proceed, Ms. Thank you, Your Honor. Let's talk about the phone evidence. I know you guys enjoyed Corbett 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So I want to take a few minutes to review the evidence that we learned from the phones. It's dry stuff, but it's super important stuff to this case. On, uh, I want to talk about the June trip first. So on June 2nd, the first trip car was rented by Garcia. At that time, Ms. McDaniel's phone records are consistent with her leaving her residence in North Bay Village. Oh, this clicker is amazing. <laughs> All right, it's a new clicker. Clicker gate just concluded. All right, so uh, at the time that this first car was rented for the first trip by Mr. <coughs> Garcia, Catherine McDaniel says, I never went to the rental place, which was Comfort Rental Car. But her phone records are consistent with her leaving her residence at North Bay Village, going to Comfort Rental Car, remaining there during the time that the rental was occurring, and then returning back to her residence. When she's at the rental car place, she gets a call from Charlie Adelson. And then on her trip back from the rental car place, she talks to Charlie Adelson for 25 minutes. It should be noted that Mr. Rivera is nowhere around. He's on the other side of town when this car was rented. Um, we know from the rental records that Garcia <coughs> trades that car out at some point, possibly because he got the ticket in the first one. And then we know that they used that second car after he made the trade out, the Sonata, to do the June trip to Tallahassee. Rivera's phone shows us an idea of the route they traveled along on their first trip to Tallahassee on June 5th, 2014. We, you don't see orange dots on here because we don't have any location information because the provider wasn't able to give us any location information for June at all for Mr. Garcia. So it doesn't mean he wasn't there. There's just no phone location information for him at all for this time period. Um, but we do know that he rented the car for the trip. The trip, the, the car that he rented did get 
the ticket. Well, the car didn't get the ticket. Mr. Rivera got the ticket in Gainesville, consistent with these blue dots. And we know that both Rivera and Garcia were seen in Tallahassee on that first trip, according to Louis Rivera and Shadrick Nobles. Remember him? Believe it. All right, so this is a slide where the GPS on the Comfort rental car uh, pinged the vehicle. So we know the location of that first vehicle June trip on June 5, 2014 at 3.17 p.m. It was very pinging very near uh, the Trescott Drive residence of Mr. Markell. So the phone gives us an idea of what they were up to. Um, showing that upon arriving in Tallahassee, they're in the area of the Budget Inn. Okay, then the next morning, they're in the area of Trescott Drive, consistent with scouting out the Markel residence, as Mr. Rivera indicates they did that day. Then Rivera returns to Miami. You can see his phone traveling along the route back to Miami arriving back in the early morning hours of June 6, 2014. So it was a one night stay in Tallahassee. They drove up, they did the scouting, it didn't work out, they couldn't find him or he wasn't alone or whatever. They couldn't get the job done and they returned back to Miami. The GPS data on the vehicle is consistent uh, with that and then this is going to be a slide which indicates the uh, what does this indicate? Hyundai GPS return. Okay, so on June 6, after Garcia and Rivera returned from the first trip to Tallahassee, Catherine McBanawa's phone. Where is it? Here is consistent with going to return the rental car. So she's consistent with going to pick it up and also going to return it. So we have the rental car consistent with being at her residence here on 6 6 of 14 at 8 48 a.m. And then we have her phone consistent with being at the rental car place when the car was returned. Again, Rivera is nowhere near the comfort rental car when that car is returned. Garcia is, and Magbanawa is. All right, this slide shows you a summary of all the communications between Magbanawa and Garcia during this first June trip. You know, there was some testimony about them talking during the trip, and this <coughs> gives you an idea of every single communication that occurred between them to make that to corroborate the possibility that those statements were in fact made. All right, I want to talk about phone events leading up to the July trip. So we're leaving the June trip, we're going to the events prior to the July trip. This slide shows phone activity the night before the Prius rental. So July 14, there's some text communication on the iCloud between Mr. Adelson and Ms. McDanawa suggesting that they're gonna get dinner together that night. And then the phone evidence indicates that Mr. Adelson picked Ms. McDanawa up and they did go out to eat. Following that dinner date, there are multiple communications between McDanawa and Garcia from midnight to 2 a.m. The next morning, July 15th, Mr. Garcia Paul's Comfort Rental Car, which is the same place that that first car was rented from. So that's significant, just in thinking of what they might have been up to, thinking about renting a second vehicle. But ultimately, Comfort is not the uh, rental place that is used for the second trip. They instead go to the hybrid Save Gas place, which is where Rivera rents the Prius. Um, during the time of the rental, the phones are consistent with both Garcia and Rivera being present for the rental of the Prius. And at the time that the Prius is rented, Magbanawa is communicating first with Charlie Adelson and then uh, with Sucreo Garcia. And there's our rental contract that includes Mr. Rivera's information as well as Mr. Garcia's number listed at the top as brother. All right, so the Prius is rented. They don't leave immediately for Tallahassee. You'll see, what are we seeing? OK, 
Okay, so this is a slide consistent with the Prius GPS. So the Prius rental company is pinging the vehicle, which they do every 24 or 25 hours to verify where the vehicle is. And that pings at 10.25 p.m. on July 15th. And that's consistent with being at Ms. Magbanoa's residence. All right, now, July, uh, we have the July trip. So on this one, we have location information for both Mr. Garcia's phone and Mr. Rivera's phone. So you can see these dots are events where their phones are communicating with towers on the way up to Tallahassee, consistent with them leaving and arriving in Tallahassee at about... I can't remember. Here's the toll plaza. So when they left Miami, they went through the toll plaza eastbound on Alligator Alley at 2.18 p.m. So I think the ticket was at like 9.30 and then they arrived in Tallahassee around 11.30 or noon. Here's a GPS ping showing the vehicle on the way to Tallahassee. Um, westbound on I-10, and that is at 11.28 p.m. And here's the budget in receipt where Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia stayed their first night in Tallahassee on the July trip. Luis Rivera testified that during this July trip, Mr. Garcia was getting some instructions and direction from Ms. Magbanoa. The trip was only about I think about 36 hours from the time they left Miami to the time that they got back to Miami. During this trip, there were 21 phone events between Garcia and Magbanawa, including 12 calls. Um, it should also be noted that on June 5th, so I'm backing you up now to June 5th, while Garcia and Rivera were in Tallahassee, Catherine Magbanawa did try to call that old number that had belonged to Louis Rivera. Um, for the first time ever in the records that we examined and wasn't able to get him because he was no longer using that phone. Um, but this is a call pattern consistent with her trying to get up with Garcia, trying to get up with Garcia, and when she can't get him, she calls other people to try to find him. And it made sense on June 5th when they were in Tallahassee that she tried to call Rivera or the number she had for Rivera because she knew they were together. So that's all the phone communications between Garcia and McBanel on the July trip. Um, so I talked about the instructions that Rivera says Ms. McBanel was giving, such as, quote, don't do anything stupid. Um, on the day before the murder, they did something stupid by shooting a hole in the Prius. They also did something pretty stupid by posting a picture of an owl um, on Instagram because, you know, obviously nobody's supposed to know where you are. And, if you're posting on Instagram, it will be obvious that you're in Tallahassee. Um, this fact is interesting because it just is something odd that maybe you wouldn't make up if you were falsifying testimony or being spoon-fed testimony. I didn't spoon-feed in the owl. Um, and, you know, we have owls here in Tallahassee, but probably not very much down in Miami where these guys live. So <laughs> Rivera probably thought it was pretty neat and worth posting on Instagram. It's interesting that Ms. McBanoa called, like, you idiots, take this thing down. Um, in addition, Ms. McBanoa told them on this date, so this is the 17th, that you have to get this done tomorrow because Dan Markell is leaving town. So that's why they knew that the job had to be completed on July 18th, and that's when it did get done. 23 phone communications between Garcia and Magbano on the July trip. Now I want to back up just a little bit, talk about the July trip starting with uh -oh, Thursday. Okay, so Thursday, July 17th, this is the day before the murder. Luis Rivera says they scouted around the Martel residence. Both phones are consistent with having done that. There are two different time periods on this date before the murder where um, both phones are consistent with being around the Markel residence. And then that evening, they're at the Roadway Inn in the room rented for them by Mr. Nobles. Both phones are consistent with the Roadway Inn that night into the morning hours of July 18th. All right. Friday, July 18th, this is the day that Dan Markel was murdered. The Prius arrives at 
Premier Jim at 9.16 in the morning. We know that from the surveillance video. And it departs around 10.38 a.m. So they wait there, stalking Mr. Markell after already having followed him to the daycare, as testified to by Mr. Leland and also Mr. Rivera. Corroboration. Um, and then the bus shows them leaving Premier and heading towards Dan Markell's residence. So with the bus videos being both right before and right after the homicide, you can narrow the time frame of Mr. Markell's death to between 1044 and 1054. We know that Mr. Markell started his phone call with uh, Mr. Schlazer at 1048, so that narrows it even further. Ten, between 1048 and 1054 is when this crime occurred. And as you recall, Mr. Geiger kind of was keeping an eye on the place for a while before he called 911, and that call came in at 1101. The first phone call that either, so that Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera's phones are consistent with being turned off in the area of Premier Gym, and there's no additional location information between then and when they're back on the interstate headed back towards Miami about um, 12.30 p.m. That's when we get any more uh after premiere, that is the first phone information we get. And that is, that piece of phone information is Mr. Garcia calling Ms. Magdanwa at 12.30 p.m. That call does connect. The conversation does occur. That information corroborates Mr. Rivera's testimony that we called her and told her it was done. She said she knew. And then we told her we wanted our money. She said we have it the next day. Um, if you look at all the parties that are involved in this case or that the state is alleging are involved, if you look at their phone activity from midnight before the murder through the first call after the murder, it's kind of interesting. You can see all the calls. The red line denotes when the murder occurred in this case. So you've got <coughs> Katie to Garcia, Charlie to Katie, you know, you can read. All right, so murder's done. They travel back to Miami and they hit this toll plaza eastbound at 5.23 p.m. Then they're seen at the Pembroke Pines ATM where Mr. Rivera does a transaction there. And after the ATM, both phones, Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia, are consistent with being at Rivera's residence at about 7 p.m. that night, the night of the murder. All right, let's talk about this Friday night meet. Where is Catherine Magdanoa once Garcia and Rivera get back to Miami after the murder? Um, between 9.46 p.m. that night, and 10.20 p.m. that night of the murder, um, this is kind of the, the red arrow is Ms. McDaniel, orange is still Mr. Garcia, and blue is still Mr. Rivera. So you can see all consistent with being at Mr. Rivera's residence for a meeting. All right, so Catherine McBanoa has two events this night with Charlie Adelson while she's in the area of Mr. Rivera's residence. 10, 12, and 10, 20 p.m., after which her phone doesn't have any activity consistent with it being turned off for that night. And then we'll go to Saturday morning. Saturday morning, July 19th, 2014. This is all the call activity for that morning. There's like a flurry of activity for about 40 minutes. Catherine Magbanoa is repeatedly trying to reach Mr. Garcia. She's unsuccessful because he's dumped his phone after the murder. Location of Ms. Magdanoa shows that she's traveling south from the area, consistent with Charlie Adelson's um, residence. Of course, it can be consistent with anything north of where she was at that time. Um, south toward uh, Rivera's residence. After seven failed attempts to call Garcia, Catherine Magdanoa finally reaches out to Anthony Ortiz because she wasn't able to reach Rivera on his phone. She calls Ortiz. That's her first communication with Ortiz ever. 
That's at 9.47 a.m. on the day of the money drop, July 19th. Anthony Ortiz, in turn, calls Garcia himself, gets no answer because Garcia's dumped his phone. That was at 9.49 a.m. Then Ortiz calls and reaches Luis Rivera at 10.02. So now Luis Rivera knows that Captain McNamara is looking for Garcia. Rivera knows where to find Garcia because he's at Shrimp's house. Then for the first time ever, first time ever, we have phone contact between Rivera at the new number, the, the number he had at the time of the homicide, and Catherine Magvanawa when she calls him at 10.22 a.m. Um, first she didn't get him, she tried Garcia again, and then one minute later she does call and get Mr. Rivera. This time his timing is consistent with when Rivera says he talked to her and she was irritated because she couldn't locate Garcia. She had the money. When are y'all going to come get this money? So between 10 and 10.30, Rivera's phone is consistent with going to the home of Garcia's new girlfriend, Shrimp. I guess Garcia was living there at the time as well. Rivera says he sent Anthony Ortiz with his, Rivera's phone. Rivera said he didn't go to get Garcia, but in any event, Garcia was fetched from Shrimp's house, and there was a meeting at Rivera's place. Um, about 10.23 to 10.32 a.m., there are events which, in which it appears Catherine Magdanawa arrives at Luis Rivera's house, and they all meet up for this money drop. So all their phones are consistent with being there. Have I missed a slide? Yes. Yeah. This is the money drop slide. All right, and what kind of money does she bring? All hundreds stapled together in stacks, consistent with the unusual way that Charlie Adelson packages his money through the, bless her heart, tooth extracting testimony of June Umchinda, who appears to be back in love with Charlie. We know he staples his money. That's a pretty weird thing, and the money they got paid with was stapled. Why does Catherine Magdanawa have to be the connection? Is it, you know, is she the only link between the people that wanted this murder done, the people with the motive to do this, and the hitmen that were just doing it for money? Rivera testified that she is the connection. But is there anything else to corroborate that? Do y'all don't want to rely on Rivera because he's a gangster and he's a murderer and he's, you know, all the things. Um, so what else do we have to corroborate what it is he's telling us about McBanoa being the link? All right, so starters, she was sleeping with both Charlie Adelson and Sufredo Garcia. That's a pretty good link. They knew each other existed, but they didn't know that she was playing both sides. Um, law enforcement reviewed all <coughs> the call detail records. So this is important. Law enforcement looked at all call detail records of McBanoa, Garcia, Rivera, Markel, Donna Adelson, Charlie Adelson, and Harvey Adelson, including Charlie Adelson's iCloud, which is hundreds of thousands of records, and also that RICO wire associated with Mr. Rivera's uh, federal conviction. And there was, in all of that data, zero evidence or proof of communication whatsoever between any Adelson and Mr. Rivera. There was no evidence or proof of communication whatsoever between the Adelsons and Mr. Garcia except for that one phone call on July 1st from Garcia to Harvey Adelson that was a hang-up or a voicemail. And that call was not answered. I don't know if it was a hang-up or a voicemail. One call, July 1st, from Garcia to Harvey Adelson, and that's how we managed to identify Garcia on the tower dump because of that connection to Harvey. Other than that, the two killers had zero communication. And the defense wants to say, well, what about all these other phones that we don't know about? Let's focus on what we know about. You know, what we don't know about, we don't know. What is the evidence? Show us. In the case, they're talking to everybody else on these phones. They're, they're doing drug deals on the phones. Charlie does his steroid deals and all that on the phones. Or the I, it's a present on the iCloud. So why would we think there's some... We would have to speculate if we want to try to say there's some other link between the Adelsons 
and the killers. It just doesn't exist. There's no evidence. What is there evidence of? A link. <coughs> and the link is named Catherine Magdalene. I mean, it seems obvious. Uh, there is no evidence or proof or records at all of Charlie Adelson and Sufredo Garcia communicating. The defense showed you that deep sea fishing text and purported that to be evidence that these two were talking. But to the contrary, if you read it in its context, I think you will see that it's evidence to the contrary, that they were not talking. Did he call you? No. Oh yeah, he did. He wants to take me deep sea fishing. Ha ha ha. Even their client on the stand admitted that was a joke and that she's not aware of any contact between Mr. Garcia and Mr. Charlie Adelson. I want to talk a little bit about the financial evidence in this case. All right, let's start with the Adelsons. What did Mary Hull tell us about the Adelsons financial picture? It was quite different from what Wendy Adelson told us about her parents. She said they were not very well off and they were not millionaires. <coughs> But what their financial records revealed is that they have 18 investment accounts totaling somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 pages worth of investments. Charlie Adelson earns between three and three and a half million dollars annually. And separately, the Adelson Institute earns another two million annually. That doesn't even include their investments. Here are the checks that Catherine McBanawa got from the Adelson Institute. The red line items indicate that these are consecutively numbered checks. Here is a photograph of the motorcycles that Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera bought. Mr. Garcia bought a car, this Monte Carlo, within one week of getting paid to do this murder. Well, the defense says this is a pretty crappy car. Okay, I mean, it's not like they got a million bucks. They blew a bunch of money. They got about $40,000. He bought a car and a motorcycle within a short period of the time from the murder. I would think that would be of importance to y'all. Defense wants to strike that. So he got $40,000, this is Mr. Garcia. He gave a couple thousand out of his cut to Mr. Rivera. So let's say he's down to 38,000. So it's not like he's gonna be able to purchase a luxury vehicle with that. But he did buy this motorcycle on August 22nd, 2014, a gold Maxima on October 17th, 2014, and the uh, Monte Carlo as well, all within three months of the Mr. Rivera bought the matching bike and also a Camry within two weeks of the murder, within two weeks. <coughs> so between the two of them, within three months of the murder, we've got five vehicles being purchased. Other than that, Mr. Rivera gave a little money to his family and managed to keep his account in the black for a couple months. I think it went back in the red in November and he started living hand to mouth off his paychecks again, as he was prior to coming up here and extinguishing the life of Dan Markell for that $37,000. Catherine Magvanawa, she deposited her money, she deposits her money, and she de makes deposits in small amounts, sometimes more than one per day at different ATM machines. She's got two different banks, and she's going around to different ATMs depositing money into multiple accounts. Note uh, on one of the exhibits, which I don't think I have in here, I don't, um, but it's exhibit 106. There's a payment to Mr. Zangane on there, uh, July 21st, 2016, $1,000. Mr. Zangane does not represent her. And September 12th, 2016, $2,000. Ms. Magdanawa says she earned this cash working off the books in a nightclub. She can name no boss, no coworkers, no patrons, 
and produced no documents whatsoever to support this contention. As evidence, she offers a photograph of herself scantily clad at what appears to be a nightclub. I don't see an apron, I don't see a tray, I don't know if she works there, I don't know when that photo was taken, I don't know nothing about nothing based on that. She also offers a check that was deposit or attempted to be deposited from Club <coughs> Fate. Yindra Mascaro indicated that she quit Club Fate because Club Fate didn't pay, their checks were bouncing. And Mary Hull confirmed that, the check that the defense has proffered in evidence for your consideration, which first of all, it's not cash, it's a check for tips, it bounced, so it cannot go into this consideration of her accounts at all. Yandra Mascaro told you that Kathleen McBanawa was not working in the clubs at the time that this murder occurred. Yandra Mascaro is Miss McBanawa's best friend. One of them is the godmother to the other one's child. I think Miss McBanawa is godmother to her child. To the contrary, Mascaro says that she and McVanawa worked together at Hollywood Live in 2014. Mascaro quit the club when she found out she was pregnant on July 4th, 2014, and McVanawa had already quit four to eight weeks prior to that because she was, quote, tired of the club life and was, quote, over it. So Kate, Catherine McVanawa quit between May 4th and June 4th, according to this testimony, 2014. It should be noted that June 4th was the first trip to Tallahassee, intended to be the murder trip. So maybe she quit that crappy job because she was anticipating this big payday that was going to happen if the murder had occurred as originally planned. And then she goes to work uh, for the Adelsons and collects a paycheck there after the homicide. She did work prior to that for Charlie Adelson's friend, Mr. Jerome Obed at uh, Broward Dermatology. She worked there for a couple months and that's indicated on here. Her Sophie Dental Care, the records are indicated on here as well. All of her employment that can be documented is present on this chart. And look where the gap is. I mean, I didn't make this up. And that's where the cash spike is. If she's working at the club, unbeknownst to Yendra Mascaro, she had the best month of her whole life, the same month that Mr. Markell was killed. If she made $1,500 a night, she only did it in July of 2014. And that was before the breast augmentation that supposedly increased her tips with a P. Objection. <coughs> her breast augmentation was in October of 2014. So to the extent that it was intended to augment her tips, it did not. They in fact declined after that time frame. Her cash deposits declined after that time frame. According to Ms. Mascaro, Ms. Magbanoa worked for Jerome Obed, Dr. Obed, at Broward Dermatology for a couple months, and then the next job that her best friend is aware of her having was at Optimar Realty. <coughs> There's the murder, that's when the murder occurred. That's when the breast augmentation occurred. All right, we're gonna get to that in just a minute. I want to wrap up the financial stuff. The check Catherine Magbanoa is using, I talked about how it was not cash. I talked about how it bounced, so it cannot explain the cash spike. In addition, according to Ms. Mascaro, you cannot make this kind of money that we're seeing on that chart. I'll go back to it. In the clubs, even on a good night, we're talking about four or $500. Ms. Magbanoa says no, it's more like $1,500. Even if she was making $1,500, it doesn't account for that spike, and the timeline doesn't add up. Ms. Mascaro says they worked one to two nights a week, each of them, that Ms. Magbanoa worked one to two nights a week. Even if she made three grand, had a $1,500 night twice in July of 2014. It's only $3,000, she's got 13,000 in deposits. Her 
her being put on the payroll at the Adelson Institute is a sham. There is no evidence of her doing any work on the weekend. She even admits she might have gone up there one time. There is no evidence of her making any calls or doing anything online, and we were listening to her phone. She wasn't able to shed any light on what it is that she does while she was on the witness stand. She said she's the personal assistant to Charlie Adelson, or was the personal assistant. I don't know what that entails, but why would the Adelson Institute be paying her? The Adelson Institute is a separate entity. Mr. Adelson travels from office to office as a freelance periodontist. Why wouldn't he pay his own personal assistant? Why is Donna Adelson writing checks out of the Adelson Institute account for Catherine Magdanawa? at a business that does not employ remote employees, does not have work to be done outside the office by phone or by laptop. That in the history of the office, Ms. Labrada has worked there 40 years. They've never had such an employee. But Magbana was the exception. She's the one that gets put on the payroll. And she's not even dating Mr. Adelson. This isn't like, hey, put my girlfriend, she's down on her luck, put her on the payroll, mom. He's chucked her already around the time of the murder. He ghosted her. And then two months later, she ends up on the payroll. Never in the history of that office have they employed one of his ex-girlfriends. Objection. Facts, not evidence. Overruled. And as we know, there were many. You heard what transpired when the officers walked in there to subpoena her employment file. Erica Johnson had to go call Charlie Adelson for direction on what to tell him. And he said, what? I'm going to have to call you. Well, first he went, uh, 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 uh. And then he said, let me call you back on your cell phone from a landline. Said, now, why would that be necessary? And when the records were provided, they were woefully lacking and shed no light whatsoever on what it is that Catherine McDonnell does there, what are her hours, what are her duties, because she didn't have any. She was paid starting within two months of the murder. She was getting consecutive checks, sometimes four at a time, all handwritten by Donna Adelson. And her best friend, Yender Mascaro, said she never worked there. She also got a lot of gifts from Charlie Adelson after the murder. She was put on the Adelson payroll, as we talked about, and you saw the list of checks. And she netted a total from them of $17,729.73. She, was, she, she did pay cash for her breast augmentation, which she says she saved up for, but there's you know, no corresponding withdrawal. She says she held back the cash deposits, but she also deposited about four grand in cash that month, so she had a pretty good month if she saved up that much money and still continued to have the steady deposits that are shown on this exhibit. Uh, states 114. On November 10th of 2015, Charlie Adelson paid $1,620.77 for repairs to her Mazda. The black Lexus, which was formerly owned by Harvey Adelson, and which she told Yendra Mascaro was a gift, and which, according to Mascaro, was in pristine condition, she acquired the title to that on January 23rd, 2016. All of these things, post-murder, and all of them post-relationship with Mr. Adelson. It should be noted that on November 5th, 2015, Charlie Adelson tells Catherine McDanawa in a text message that his dad had recently put five grand into the Lexus before he bought it from his dad. On November 6th, 2015, Charlie Adelson gives Catherine McDanawa his credit card. On May 20th, 2015, she's asking Charlie Adelson for money when at the time she had $15,000 in her account. Six days later, she deposited $1,400 in cash. She has no recollection of ever getting any cash from Mr. Adelson. There was a lot of back and forth between the state and defense about these financial benefits and gifts, but I think the bottom line is clear. She was receiving some very unusual treatment for an ex-girlfriend. There's nothing wrong with giving people gifts or loans or handouts, but when you look at this financial picture in comparison to the homicide date, it's pretty undeniable that she had this huge benefit that coincided dead on with the murder of Mr. Markell. 
Mr. Rivera said that her cut was $30,000 for her part in this crime, $30,000. If you subtract her identifiable legitimate income from her cash deposits in 2014, guess what the difference is? $30,000. That, when considered with the Adelson Institute checks and the other gifts she received and all the other evidence in this case, is very compelling evidence. Catherine Magdanoa says she earned the money at the club, but you know she wasn't in the club because of Ms. Mascara's testimony. Now, she may have gone back to the club after the murder, but at the time of this spike, she was not in the club. Also of importance, before we leave Ms. Mascara and go to the wire, the night Dan Markell was shot, Catherine Magdanoa asked Yendra Mascara to watch her kids. This was an unusual request for her to keep the kids overnight. This is the night that Magdanoa's phone is consistent with meeting Rivera and Garcia at Rivera's residence, the one where Jessica lived, and then leaving them, the phone is off all night, and then the next morning, she's traveling south talking to Charlie Adelson for 25 minutes, and then her phone is consistent with the money drop, which was that slide I showed you before, all consistent with Mr. Rivera's residence. When she shows up at Ms. Mascara's house to pick her kids up that day, that morning, she tells Ms. Mascara that Charlie Adelson's brother-in-law has been in a car accident. All right, let's talk about the wire. When the undercover hands Donna Adelson an article about her murdered son-in-law, insinuates that she was involved, and then tried to extort $5,000 out of her, does she go straight to the police? This person has information about who it was that killed her son-in-law. This is a cold case. He was executed in cold blood in his driveway in Tallahassee, and now this man approaches her and he knows about it? A, that's really scary for her, and B, she's going to solve this murder. But what does she do? Does she report it to law enforcement? Nope. She goes straight to Charlie Adelson, who goes straight to Catherine Magbanawa, who goes straight to Sigfredo Garcia. This is exactly what this undercover operation was designed to ferret out. Where will this information travel if we put it in the hands of Donna Adelson? She calmly folds that piece of paper and puts it in her bag without even looking at it. She goes to pick up her grandsons from school. She returns home and she calls Charlie Adelson. They meet the next day. <coughs> it's crucial to note that while the first few calls are not in evidence, you don't have the content of the conversations between Charles Adelson and Donna Adelson, the fact about those calls has come in for you to consider, which is that Charlie Adelson, Donna did not say the name Katie to Charlie Adelson before this meeting. We don't know what they said in this meeting. We tried to surveil it, but we couldn't. It was too loud or whatever. We couldn't record it. But the phone calls prior to this meeting do not include any mention of the name Katie or Catherine McBanawa, despite the fact that the undercover did say it. And before this meeting, Charlie Adelson calls Catherine McBanawa. So he was not told the name. Yet, out of all his ex-girlfriends, I think it's 87, he says in one place. That's probably exaggerated, but maybe not. He calls one, one ex-girlfriend, Catherine McBanawa. Then he goes to meet his mother to get the details. And he tells Ms. McBowell in that first call, you know, oh, maybe it's not you. I just, you know, they said ex-girlfriend. So I'm calling you. I'll, I'll get back to you if it does involve you. And then he gets back to her. Because it does involve her. So you've heard these initial calls where they're kind of dancing around the issue. He can't know for sure whether or not she's a part of this this because this guy's representing himself as 
some Latin king guy that knows information about the murderer, knows the killer. So is Catherine Magvano involved in the plot to extort his mother? He can't be sure at this point. Neither can be sure that it's not the police. They both know they're under suspicion. So they're just feeling each other out in those first few calls. Ooh. Call F seems to be um, the first one where they kind of drop that. So Charlie's offering to pay for Catherine Magbanawa and Sufredo Garcia to go on a weekend getaway and call F. Call K, which I tried to include. Oh. All right, so forget what I said about call K. The Dolce Vita meeting, you know that we can't hear very much in this, but I want to play it for you so that you can see him looking at the paper. Alright, let's see if I can make it play. Bagbanawa cannot recall any of the contents of that conversation other than Mr. Adelson was talking about scenarios. I'm going to tell you something right now and I'm going to make it very clear. I'm going to make something very clear because you're talking belligerent bullshit. I'm going I'm to make something very clear, okay? Why? Because you don't know how to apologize because you were wrong. Okay? This is the same thing that happened last time. Listen, I have a more pressing matter that I have to attend to. Okay? I don't feel secure because you take care of everybody else. Where's my security? So when are you going to step up for me? When is that going to happen? Because I feel like everybody else gets the, uh, the special attention and then Katie you go figure it out you go figure it out you figure out the kids you figure out life you figure Katie, out your Katie, 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 you figure you're out so life. Katie you're doing this again this is the same shit I've been here I've never felt happier Every we were time. so happy we you were so happy. we were you so happy all right, all right, man. All right, all right. Then fine. Then then go. Whatever. Fine. Go. If that's what you need to do to make yourself happy, then I'm not gonna hold you back. Why do you have to go through back everything? After everything we went through, why does it have to go back to square one? Do you know how bad I feel? It's like a guilt trip. It's like I don't feel like I'm getting the same thing. Kitty, listen. Kitty, listen. 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 Where to God? It's just like it's like I should just go somewhere because it's like you're basically do that. Over. Do you're that. me over. You're gonna tell me I'm gonna make a phone call. Are you? I'm not making that fucking phone call. This is a clip from Call K. This is the first call where we hear Sigfredo Garcia, and he's not happy. Maybe because he has. Ha learn for the first time that Charlie Adelson is involved in this whole thing. Maybe he's learned that Charlie Adelson was the one that really paid him to do the deal. That's just a theory. But what we know is that McBanawa was asked to get to the bottom of this and figure out who was behind it, who it was that approached Charlie Adelson's mother. She assures Charlie Adelson she's going to handle it herself. But what she does is go to Sigfredo Garcia and put the task on him. You call the phone number. You figure out who it is. Fucking do what you want to do. Do it. I'm gonna take care of my fuck. I'm gonna take care of this fucking problem. I'm gonna take care of this fucking problem. And then.
Because they let you know the better of the man. No, you're making so, so, Man, just stop talking on the phone, man. Bye. What... Here's a slide of text S, which was introduced into evidence on April 26, 2016. Garcia says to Mac Banawa, whatever is going on with you and your homie, who she admits is Charlie Adelson, is your business. You guys work that shit out. Don't text me. Catherine McBanawa admits that Garcia could not stand Charlie Adelson. In call L, <clears throat> Catherine McBanawa is giving Garcia the undercover's number, and she does it in code. This is really important piece of evidence. What was her explanation for why she was talking in code? Because my kids were around or my coworkers were around. Well, you're given a phone number. Why does that need to be coded? She's talking about Ethan's clothes cost $65.70. What's that about? That's the last four digits of the undercover number. Of course, he doesn't get it, and she has to repeat it several times, and eventually he does get it. After she says, the amount that I gave you on that piece of paper, I'm not sure if it's $67.50 or $65.70. And he goes, got it. I asked Catherine Magdalena, why would it be necessary? Did she give an explanation for that that was reasonable to y'all? In the next several calls, the three of them, Charlie Adelson, Catherine McDowell, and Sigfredo Garcia, proceed to have you know, this ridiculous, what's the number, what's the number, back and forth conversation, trying to get this number straight, and really trying to, all trying to act like they're calling it when they're not calling it. Call Z is the one where Charlie Adelson is indicating to Catherine McDowell that he wants the problem flushed. And that was a joke in the sense that it was potty humor, but I think it was a reference to what the real problem was that he did in fact want flushed. Then he says, why don't you guys go on vacation, leave the kids at home, have a cocktail and call it a day. He offers to pay for that vacation. Why is Charlie Adelson offering to pay for her and her baby daddy to go on vacation? Charlie's trying to get Catherine McBanawa to call that number. McBanawa is trying to get Garcia to call it. Garcia's lying to McBanawa about having called it. McBanawa's lying to Charlie about having called it. Charlie is lying to his mother, assuring her that he's got it all figured out and it's no problem. And that, you know, alluding that it's the police, it's not any real threat. And then there's states DD. Catherine McBanawa and Charlie Adelson. Um, somebody called my dad's office. So whatever's left is left. What's that? I'm told I have about 30 minutes right, remaining, no. so I'm going to keep going, finish what I have planned. Happened. Um, somebody called my dad's office mm -hmm. today looking for him. Saying okay. that they dropped off some paperwork uh, to him. Mm -hmm. well, there was a phone number on there, and that's the person left the message with Erica. work with Dr. Adelson last week and I left the number on there and he needs to call me at that number. Somebody said fucking me wrong. 305 that one is 65 You have the number. Exactly. That number is fucking It's like a non-working number. I mean, it's someone who wants you to be called back. 
let's put it that way. Do you, do you still have that number? Yeah, well, obviously that number, nobody picks me up. Well. That's a not, not a working number. It's like a Gmail number. Nobody, nobody's calling the leg. I'm just asking you to find out who the fuck it is. It's like, yeah. get that number that's off of your, off of the thing, off of the number, off of the freaking, um, caller ID. At the office? Yes, obviously. So this is like a fucking bullshit game. Well, they're not, they're not coming out on foot, they're not writing letters, and they're not calling the office because they have nothing better to do. <coughs> I don't know what to talk about because it's like not even a fucking joke anymore. It's not a fucking joke. It's like somebody's harassing you guys, somebody's harassing, and you're joining, and it's like. No, I'm not going to straight from my fucking cell phone because it's fucking bullshit. It's fucking somebody trying to fucking pinpoint some bullshit. Like, it's it's getting aggravating. Yeah, it is. All I'm saying is find out who the fuck it is and tell them to stop playing their games. You're an idiot. You gave a fucking wrong number. Get the fucking number and fucking call because I'm gonna call them. It needs to be nipped in the bud. No, I'm gonna handle this shit myself. Don't give a shit about all these bullshit. I'm gonna handle my motherfucking self. Well, straight my motherfucking number. They fucking if if Erica wants to call back, they're like, oh, is this the right number? Okay, I have your fucking whatever fucking shit taken care of. Okay, because this is fucking bullshit. So what I'm saying is, find out. Who the fuck That number doesn't is. fucking work. If you can get a hold, you go to different offices, call the motherfucking number. See if the fucking number works. Bottom line. Because I've tried myself, and that shit does not work. Hey, call them, find out who the fuck it is now. Trust me on this. Fuck find it, out who bro. the fuck it is. Get the number, listen to me, and get the number. I'm going to call my mom and have my mom call the get office. Get the fucking number. Because Which number? Your fucking parents, that number's been called, and I'm glad it's not a working number. Because I have somebody's making, somebody's typing into some shit, and somebody's just trying to fucking aggravate somebody. Okay. Alright, so this is called DD. You couldn't hear it very well. But those were some clips from it. And Miss Magdanawa <laughs> drops the code in this, and she says it. She's like, I'm done with this code crap. And really kind of reveals herself a little bit. And it's after this call that Charlie Adelson finally does actually call the undercover, and you heard the call GG that he had with the undercover. What does Charlie Adelson say when the undercover explains that since his family's problem has been taken care of up north, Charlie Adelson has been taking care of Katie and Tudo, but has done nothing for Tato? Does he say, what family problem up north? What are you talking about? Why did you hand a picture of my murdered brother-in-law to my mother? or I have no idea what you're talking about. No, he says, all right, let me look into things. Quote, then in HH, Charlie Adelson is reporting back to Magbanawa what his conversation was with the undercover and called GG. Mr. Adelson says that the undercover says Tuto and Tato. He doesn't, but he just says he doesn't know them. Magbanawa knows exactly who Tuto and Tato are, but she doesn't enlighten Mr. Adelson as to who these folks are. On um, JJ, Ms. McBanawa reports the latest bump, which was the call to the Adelson Institute to Mr. Garcia and says, quote, it's getting too detailed. It's somebody that knows for sure. This call ends with more discussion about what the number is. Garcia wants McBanawa to text it to him and she says, no, I don't want to. Why not? If you're just helping out a friend to investigate something you have nothing to do with, why talking code? Why the fear of texting the number? Call PP, Ms. McBanawa is bragging about the really nasty voicemail that she left on the undercover's uh, voice me message machine when she nor Garcia have left any such voicemail. She's playing both sides, Garcia against Charlie and back and forth, telling them both what they want to hear. In the same call, PP, she's discussing in code the different scenarios that the bump could be. Adelson suggests in code that it's the cops, and Magdanawa says, quote, that's one scenario, but you know, you've got to figure out the other things just in case. It can only be one of the two, apparently. It's somebody that's desperate, not from the inside. 
quote, that's what I know for a fact. It's not from the inside. It's somebody trying to be greedy. I'm hoping I'm on the right lead, and either way, my friend said that either way, no matter what, he takes total responsibility of whatever just because of the mere fact of my name. That's the wire. I want to talk to you, I know I'm running out of time, but briefly about the law. The crime charged is a first degree murder because it was premeditated. I don't even really want to talk to you about lesser included offenses and waste my valuable tiny minutes that are dwindling because this is about the most premeditated murder imaginable. We've got stalking and following and planning and trips and stuff going back a year in time. <coughs> We talked in jury selection so very, very long ago about how there's no fixed amount of time to generate premeditation. You certainly, certainly have lots of evidence in this case. This murder began with the failed relocation efforts when Charlie Adelson first looked into hiring a hitman. It took root when Catherine Magbanoa enlisted Mr. Garcia, who enlisted Mr. Rivera, to do this killing. That planning went into the killing, was, was extensive, spanning a six week period, including 2,000 mile trips made in rented vehicles, scouting out the scene, stalking Professor Markell, and all the planning, all the meetings, all the calls came to fruition when Garcia fired those two shots into <coughs> Mr. Markell's vehicle and devastated so many lives in an instant. When you think about how this case was proven, we started at a single point, the crime scene, and we went in two totally different directions. We chased the Prius, and we chased this lead that there was bad blood between the family. And the investigation would have completely stalled if either of those leads had not generated anything. But all those little breadcrumbs led to the same place. The Prius led to Rivera, Rivera led to Garcia, and the bad blood led to the Adelsons, and both trails end at Catherine Magbanoa. When you consider the principal instruction as it relates to these two defendants, I expect you will determine that the instruction does not really apply to Mr. Garcia if you find that he pulled the trigger. If you don't think that's been proven, then you should convict him as a principal to Mr. Rivera in that he hired Mr. Rivera to do the crime, rented the first car for the purpose of coming to Tallahassee to kill and or stalk Mr. Markell, and that he made both trips and participated in the stalking of the victim and casing the residence. In reference to Catherine Magbanoa, I do expect that the principal instruction will be crucial to your considerations for her count one murder charge. There are two ways to prove Ms. Magbanoa's guilt for first degree murder under principal theory. One, if she intended that the murder be done and she did some act or said some word that caused or helped another to commit the crime, then she is also guilty of first degree murder. Think about a buyer who hires a contractor to build his home. The contractor, Magbanoa, gets money from the buyer and hires and pays subs to do the work while getting her own cut of the payment. Second way, if she intended the murder to be done and she promised payment in exchange for the murder, bless you, and the crime was committed by another person, she's also guilty of first degree murder. So two ways to prove the, pre, uh, the principal theory. Under the second way to prove the principal theory, think of Ms. Magbanoa as assisting someone who wanted Markel dead and was willing to pay. So she located, hired, and paid the hitman for his the hitman and ultimately his helper for committing the crime. Both ways have been proven. I would suggest that you should convict her under both theories of principle. Both of these defendants are guilty of everything they're charged with. You have been so very patient throughout this process. And when you get back to the deliberation, I to the deliberation room, I urge you to take your common sense with you, and that's in the jury instructions as well. It all really boils down to that. If the defense or I have offered or asked you to speculate about anything, don't do that. The jury instructions tell you not to do that. Remember that what any of us say is not evidence. They may ask you to discount evidence, but that's up to you to make a decision. They make an argument about discounting it or not. That's ultimately up to you whether or not to accept or discount 
any piece of evidence or testimony. They may tell you that because all the evidence fits, it's not what it appears, it's something else. They may tell you that the state is blindly or willfully misleading you in some way. Your feelings about the lawyer should not influence your verdict. If you think that, you know, I'm crooked and I've been spoon fed and all that, that's something you can consider as far as how it affected the evidence in the case. But your personal feelings about me and whether I'm as crooked as they say should not affect your verdict in a case. You should use your common sense in deciding which evidence to believe and which evidence to discard. We are all trusting you to render a wise and legal verdict in this case, and based on all the evidence and testimony that y'all have painfully sat through over this long period of time, that verdict should be a verdict of guilty as charged. Thank you. Let's, let's take as quick a break as we can. Let's keep it as close to five minutes as we can. I know it takes a while. We have one breath. We'll be entering this.